thank you. And thank you to the uh, other speakers in the session for adding about 10 minutes to my time. <laughs> now I can get to the talk. Also, I want to mention that I'm uh, continuing the tradition of the most junior person on the paper to give the talk. Um, all right, so let's have a closer look at the uh, algorithm to compute the, the curve discrete logarithms. So I only put this slide because I could mention the word Bitcoin, which is always good these days. Um, okay, so all of these curves will be broken, but how broken? Right. So what are the exact uh, resources we need for actually computing the discrete log with Shor's algorithm? So when we started to work on this, we were really interested to implement this to really write down the exact circuits and simulate them, test them to find bugs, and then precisely count all qubits gates and the depth by getting it from the implementation. Um, there's a previous work on this by Cruz and Zalka from 2004, and since then almost nothing has happened. So they describe the whole algorithm in their paper, um, but it's all text. It's very nice, uh, nicely written, but there's no concrete circuit. And some of these um, methods there, it wasn't clear to us whether that would actually work. So we really wanted to test uh, their algorithm. All right. So what is the elliptic curve discrete logarithm problem? Uh, as you all know, uh, elliptic curves, the rational points form an abelian group. Um, and we're going to restrict right away to the large characteristic case that is common in crypto, uh, a large characteristic prime p, and we look at the rational points over that field. Um, and then this group has usually a prime order or a small cofactor times a prime. And um, yeah, the exponentiation in this group we write in additive notation so that becomes a scalar multiplication. Um, n times p, for example. And then the ECDLP is given two points, uh, p and q, of prime order r, for example, such that q is a multiple of p. Uh, we need to find out. All right, so here's a very rough description of short algorithm. And it has uh, the specific uh, quantum characteristic elements. Uh, so the first, if n is the bit size of the prime, then the first step in this algorithm is to produce a superposition over two n plus one bit registers. So we chose n plus one here because if the prime is n bits, then you can get all the scalars with, it, with n plus one bits. So first step is doing this uh, superposition. And you see we have a third register here, which has a elliptic curve point. Um, and then the second step, this is actually just a evaluation of a classical function, right? So we're computing this multi-scalar multiplication over there. Um, and then, after that, another typical quantum step, a quantum Fourier transformation. And this is done to do uh, phase estimation, right? In this case, it's uh, uh, to find the period of, of this function that maps KL to KP plus so Q. And once we have that, we, get, we can do some classical processing to get the discrete log as a ratio of uh, those two values, k and l. All right, so how does this look as a circuit picture? Um, so on the left here, we have those two uh, registers where we start off with zeros. We do the superposition with Hadamard gates. Um, and then this is how we do the uh, multi-scalar multi so all these points, P and Q, these are classic, we're given the problem in a classical form, right? So we know P and Q, so we can pre-compute all those, nothing we need to do on a quantum computer. So all these points, those two power multiples we already have, and then we just make circuits that specifically do this point addition <coughs> in a controlled way. On the right, you have the quantum Fourier transforms and measurements in the end. Um, but this is actually quite wasteful on qubits, so there's a smarter way to do that, which is uh, using the semi-classical Fourier transform. And that just takes this parallel, so to say, uh, superposition thing and then 
uh, doing a Fourier transform at the end, it just does it serially on one qubit. And this, this looks very, well, maybe I'll rewrite something like that on the slides as well. So the standard phase estimation picture looks something like that. So here the difference now is we do measurements on this qubit after each uh, round, and then the next uh, these, these phase shift matrices they depend on all previous measurements. So Borrega uh, had this had this factoring algorithm that uses this. That's the more or less best algorithm for factoring, which uses two n plus two qubits if you do it with the NR et al. Um, implementation. Okay, so we're going to do uh, this instead so we can save all these qubits. And then if you look uh, in, at the details, so these are just very simple uh, single qubit gates. Um, they don't cost a lot and they're really not a, lot, a big part of the computation. So we can just focus on, on the point addition here. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to express these things as Toffoli gate networks. So the Toffoli gate is this doubly controlled not gate. And it's known that this is universal for reversible computing. Um, and it's very convenient. So um, it's a classical gate actually, so we can easily um, simulate it classically. Um, and there's some advantages. Uh, you can do debugging more easily. And even if you want to run this later on a real quantum computer, and this quantum computer is, uh, has, for example, the Clifford plus T gate set implemented, then you can exactly um, implement the top of the gate. Uh, I think it takes about seven T gates or something. OK, so this is the setting. Let's revisit our motivation uh, page here. So the plan is as follows. We're not going to do the whole uh, Shor algorithm. We're just going to focus on the point addition. Uh, we have a choice here, right? We can't really simulate, of course. We can't really simulate for proper parameters the whole algorithm. That would be fun. Uh, so we, we can either do small parts for real-world parameters, or we do small parameters and do the whole thing. So we decided to have a go at real-world parameters, and then just focus on the curve uh, addition. We're going to count everything in terms of top of the gates, because they are the most costly. and then. And for getting the cost for the whole algorithm, we just multiply uh, those gate numbers by 2n because we do so many steps. All right, so what do we have to do? Uh, and I really like that we can go to the uh, good old affine short Weierstrass curve. Um, so down there is the <coughs> point addition good old formula, and this is the case where we don't have any special cases, so neither of the points is the point at infinity, and they're not the same, and also not negatives of each other, and then this is the formula we have. Most people have seen this, right? So now this needs to be implemented in a reversible way. So we have to have a, an accumulator point here, some auxiliary qubits, and then we add this constant two to the IP. And we would like to do that um, by having as few qubits as possible. Um, so there's a, there's a generic way to take any computation and make it reversible. You just basically store a lot of the intermediate values, and then later you have to run it backwards or do the computation again to clean things up. Um, but this usually blows up uh, the number of qubits a lot. So we're trying to do something smarter. Um, also, we will um, use the fact that the modulus is classically known and constant at all these points, as I mentioned, so that we're not using any qubits for storing these, so this can all be baked into the uh, circuits. And then our objective here is to first optimize qubits, and then the number of gates. Okay, so here's a very simple observation, so this is again computing the point P3, which is P1 plus P2. These are the formulas. And they are actually, I mean, it's an abelian group law, so we can just switch you know, 1 and 2. It doesn't matter. Um, and then if we add P1 plus P2, what is the, how do we go back? We subtract P2 again, right? So P1 is P3 plus 
we minus p2, and we can write down the formulas for the for those coordinates. And I look at that, and we get a different slope. So this lambda, that's actually the slope. If you draw the coordinate tangent rule for adding two points on an elliptic curve, you get exactly this lambda. And then you get the other one over there. And if you take any, well, this one, or a bad formula and solve it for lambda, you will see that this lambda is actually the negative of the one going back. So this is not very surprising, and many people have probably seen this before. But this is also what Proust and Zalka used in their paper. So, and th this is a smarter way to actually clean things up. Clean up. So don't read this, this is just a straight line program of the elliptic curve group law um, in terms of functions uh, operating on qubit registers. But if you look at these red things, so here, so if it's the bracket with the one that needs a control beta set, so we're actually doing the operation, and if it's a zero, then you can see in the end we have done nothing. But here is the slope that's computed here. And then you can see here, we're computing it again and cleaning it up this way, but we're using already the things we have computed along the way. Um, so this is how it looks as a circuit picture. But here you can also see how many qubits we need. We need n for, well, actually 2n for the curve uh, coordinates, and then n for the slope. And then we need another um, temporary register here. Um, Oh yeah, and then we have this control thing. That's also interesting to note here. We don't, if you want to, so we could write this down without the control. Um, but if you want to control the whole point addition, you don't have to control every single operation. We just need to do these five ones here. If you take them out, you can go through the circuit and see that actually in the end it does nothing. It does some computations and then it reverses them. Um, in the end. And that's a principle we've also applied to s several of the modular arithmetic um, algorithms, which we're going to talk about now, because now we need to look at all these functions, right? So these are subtractions of constants. Here's an inversion, finite fields, a multiplication, and so on and so forth. All right, modular arithmetic. So we started at some uh, previous work, so we took the integer addition subtraction circuits from the Takahashi et al. paper. And then, as I mentioned, because we have constant modulus, we regularly need, need just additions and subtractions of constants. And we took that from Anner et al., um, where they basically did a very similar work for the factory algorithm. And now here you can see how modular addition looks. This is just an integer addition. And then what we do, so we add those two integers, we subtract p anyway, then we look whether it got negative, and if so, we add it back, and then we compare to clean up this, this bit. For the doubling, you can do some optimization here, you don't have to do the uh, addition, it's just the shift here to get the times two. And for an odd modulus, you can just look at the last bit in the end, whether you have subtracted p or not, because <coughs> supposed to be even if you didn't subtract p, otherwise it's odd. All right, so now it becomes a bit more interesting, modular multiplication. Um, so this is the pro approach by Cruz and Zalka. That's how they describe it in their paper. They say, OK, we take one of the integers in the x here in the bit decomposition. And then you can write the multiplication like that. Right? So you can so from the inside out, um, you add conditionally under x n minus 1 the value y to an accumulator register, and then you double it, and so on and so forth. That comp computes exactly this uh, expression up there. And note here, what we do, these are modular operations. So we do reductions in every step here, in the addition, in the doubling, and so on and so forth. So that looks pretty compact, and you just only need these two n plus a little bit more qubits. Um, but that looks pretty costly in terms of depth. And then, of course, because it works, we can all also look at Montgomery multiplication. Right? Um, the difference here is now these blocks are not modular operations. These are just integer additions, so that's a lot cheaper. 
right? So it has a similar structure. We go through the bits of x, and we again add y to the accumulator, and then the standard Montgomery thing is to look at is the intermediate result even. If not, we add p to make it even, then we can divide by 2. And this is just yeah, those three operations. So that looks, uh, if you expand the previous modular ones, um, then this is way more complicated. And here it's, it's really a lot simpler. There's a problem here, though. We need some more qubits. You can see those down here. Um, these are the bits that tell you whether you added p or not. And we sort of have to keep them around. We didn't find a way to get rid of them. So that, then the problem here is we have to later run this algorithm backwards to clean them up. So we actually have to do it twice to get a multiplication. But still, in the end, I'll show you the numbers <coughs> in a few slides. Uh, it was better to do Montgomery for reasons I will mention. So we have uh, multiplications, additions, subtractions. Now we also need an inversion. And for this, we deviated from the Pros and Zaka paper. What they suggested is just to do regular Euclid, the regular Euclidean algorithm, but we couldn't really see how to do that uh, easily. So this one is a lot easier. So that's the binary GCD. So you have essentially four steps here. Um, you just look at the numbers. It's the first one even, you divide it by two. The second one even, divide it by two, and so on and so forth. You always construct things, you can divide by two. And then, as in regular Euclid's algorithms, you have these uh, variables that go along in the end. One of them will be the inverse. So this doesn't exactly compute the inverse. You have a power of 2 here. But when you're working in Montgomery representation, uh, you just add a certain power of 2 here, and uh, multiply a certain power of 2 to, to correct that. Um, so this is already, this looks more complicated than all the multiplications. And uh, so here, is this while loop, and there's a, an upper bound on this, 2n, so we have to run it 2n times. Um, so that's what one round of this looks like. Um, so first of all, start maybe in this uh, um, little box here. So you can see this is actually the first step. This is if u is even, you divide by 2, multiply the corresponding coefficient here by 2. And that's the second one, third one, and fourth, right? And all this stuff here just collects information about u and v. It just encodes it down here in these qubits, and that's used here to select which, which case it is. Um, so now we have to run this uh, n, uh, two n times, but we don't know when it's done. And this is what is done here. We check whether the v is 0. So this is a flag qubit that essentially starts out 1. Um, it stays 1 until v becomes 0. Then it flips. And what it does, it doesn't do this whole block anymore. It just increments a counter down here. I apologize, this is not the same k as the one before. This is basically n minus k um, in the end. OK, so this uh, two n times. But it looks complicated. But on the other hand, these are just integer additions. So it's, it's not a lot more than a multiplication. And that's what you can see here. Um, so we really wrote all this stuff in this liquid framework, which in the future is a sharp based uh, quantum computing language toolkit. Um, and then we have some functions that can count gates. I mean, the qubits we can just count ourselves. Um, OK, so you can see this double and add multiplication uses fewer qubits than Montgomery, but then twice as many gates. <coughs> and since we're using this inversion, we have a lot of qubits lying around anyway. We thought we could just use those, so we really can write it down by using only the qubits um, in the inversion, and then save on the, on the depth here. So overall, we just went for the Montgomery multiplication. Okay, and these are real simulation results for the NIST um, standardized elliptic curve primes. Um, so you can see, for example, for P256, we need 2,330 qubits, about 10 to the 11 Toffoli gates. 
Um, so the depth we also computed automatically from the circuit generated by the program, and it's usually a little bit smaller than the overall number of gates, so it's really a long serial computation um, overall. So we, we got away with 9n plus something qubits, and that differs slightly from the 6n predicted by Cruz and Saga. So there are several reasons for that. One is that they use the regular Euclid and they claim you can do um, register sharing. So these variables u and v uh, and r and s we had in the binary Euclid, they occur in the regular one as well. And if you look, they started out with uh, p, the number you want to invert, 0 and 1. And you can always pair two of them together and they will never use, so a pair of them will never use more than n qubits, so they can reuse that, but it's very complicated to implement that, so we didn't do that. And then there's something, I think they forgot a register in the original paper, which they just dropped somewhere. We couldn't get rid of it. Um, and then, as a comparison to the factoring algorithm, so this, uh, on the same line, uh, we've put uh, equivalent classical security levels according to the NIST. Uh, recommendations. So in the 256 bit line, we pair that with a 3072 bit RSA modulus. Um, and then you can see uh, it seems to be harder to factor. So actually, these two algorithms, I think, have a similar level of optimization. So you can actually compare. There's some other algorithms you can do on the factoring side. Um, so but, but at the level we're comparing this, it, it seems to be, be fair here. So that would uh, suggest that the curves break earlier than uh, I'm saying. All right, that's it, thank you. Yes, that's logical qubits. Yeah. And uh, the second one is, well, my knowledge about quantum engineering is negligible, so maybe it's nonsense. Uh, but uh, does the topology of the circuit matter? So I see that very often wires jump uh, from one qubit at the top, maybe to one at the bottom. And I wonder if that's some sort of extra hardness. Uh, Definitely it is. So we neglected all that. We just started from the logical level. But definitely it is a problem. Yeah, the, uh, the, the layout of the processor is important and then you cannot just, for example, I, you saw I split up these, some of these functions where part of it was in the top and it's probably not that easy in the end, right? So if you really want to implement that on a concrete computer with a two-dimensional layout, it matters that things are close or not. Yeah. Okay. So looking at uh, this number, uh, the number of qubits is actually quite reasonable, but the number of totally gates is surprisingly high. So how difficult is it uh, to build uh, 10 to the 12 Toffoli gates, the quantum uh, pieces of hardware, and I have no idea whether it uh, is an insurmountable uh, uh, difficulty, or 10 to the 12 Toffoli gates is uh, easy to do. Can you say a few words? I today? must say I don't really know. I would have to ask Martin for that. Um, but I know that some people are talking about certain other applications where such numbers, similar numbers occur and they claim that it can be done. Um, at this point I doubt this is reasonable within a reasonable amount of time, but I don't really know. Because everyone is discussing the number of qubits you need and yeah. this is the first time I hear about uh, the number of Toffoli gates being so high and being uh, an impediment. Yeah. I mean as comparison there's this paper by Martin and others on AES where the number of Toffoli gates for breaking AS with Grover is 2 to the 86. So that, in that comparison, this is rather small. Um, but also, we don't claim that any is broken, right? <laughs> okay, any others? <laughs>